All right, so this is the last video of Unit 6. Um, we're going to be focusing on when precipitates form, um, why you have to have certain concentrations of each of the ions making up your solid, um, and that you have to have a minimum amount of the amount equal to um, the product of the two ions in terms of the KSP value to see that precipitate form. If it's less than the KSP value, your solution is unsaturated and the ions will remain in solution. If it's equal to it, it's right on the precipice of forming a precipitate, so it's a saturated solution. And then if it's greater than it, we do shift back to the reactant side forming our precipitate. So I've got four examples for us to go through to kind of see the quantitative side of this. And the first one's going to be looking at solid silver chloride. Um, you have two ions making up silver chloride, silver and chlorine, and they were each 1.2 times 10 to the negative fifth molar in your beaker. And what I want to know is when they're at those concentrations, have they reached equilibrium? Is the solution saturated or is it supersaturated? And you're given the KSP of silver chloride is 1.8 times 10 to the negative tenth, which is pretty small, so you don't need a whole lot of silver or chlorine for the precipitate to begin to form. So the first thing I always do in these particular um, problems is write my equation showing the um, ionic solid dissociating into its ions, silver and chlorine. And from that I can write my KSP expression, accounting for the fact that solids are not included. I know what the concentration was of silver and chlorine, so if I substitute those in to that expression and solve for Q, I can compare it to the KSP value to see if precipitation does take place. The Q is 1.4 times 10 to the negative tenth, which is just shy of your KSP value. So as a result, we have not quite reached equilibrium. We are slightly unsaturated, but it won't take a whole lot more to cause us to become saturated. So our second example is, um, rather than me giving you both concentrations, I'm going to give you one of the two, and we're going to see if you can determine what the other concentration would need to be for precipitation to take place. Um, so for precipitation to occur, again, we want to have a saturated solution, so we want our Q value to be equal to our K. Um, we're dealing with barium sulfate, so we're going to take barium sulfate and split it into its ions, Ba2 plus and SO4 2 minus. Our KSP expression will be those two ions multiplied together. And if we have the KSP value and we have the concentration of the barium, we should be able to determine what the minimum concentration of sulfate ions will need to be added in order for the precipitate to begin to form. Okay, so 1.1 times 10 to the negative tenth was our KSP for barium sulfate. Um, it's a fairly insoluble compound, and you've got your barium, the 0.01 molar, and we can solve for sulfate, and when you go through and do the math, you should get that sulfate's concentration is 1.1 times 10 to the negative eight. So very little sulfate will need to be added to your mixture for precipitation to occur. The second half of the problem, you're given the sulfate concentration and you want to find the barium one. So you can use the same reaction and the same KSP equation, but this time we're solving for barium's concentration rather than sulfate. When we divide it into the KSP value, we get that the concentration of barium is even less because we had a greater concentration of sulfate. 7.3 times 10 to the negative 9. So hopefully what you're seeing here is that as the concentration of one of the two ions increases, you will need even less of the other ion respectively um, to reach the saturation level for your substance. Um, if you have one of the ions raised to an exponent um, because of the ratio between them, that may play a role as well. But in this particular one, because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, as one goes up, the other goes down. Um, I have a couple students in the room today while I'm taping this one. Um, so we are looking at a solution that contains two metal ions, barium and calcium. And I want to know if you add hydroxide to the solution, which of those two will precipitate first? The barium hydroxide precipitate or the calcium hydroxide precipitate? And if you look at the KSP values, you'll see that barium hydroxide has a slightly larger KSP value compared to calcium hydroxide. So if I was going to predict, given that the concentrations are relatively equal, I would suspect that calcium hydroxide is going to require a smaller amount of OH, and we'll see how my hypothesis um, turns out, if it was supported or not. Um, so just like any other precipitation problem, the first thing I want to do is write my equation and set up my KSP expression. So I did that here for barium hydroxide. 
Notice because there were two OHs in barium hydroxide, I needed to put a coefficient of 2 in front of the OH on the product side. So the KSP would be barium's concentration times hydroxide's concentration squared. I know the KSP of barium hydroxide, and I know the concentration of barium. So if I substitute those in, I should be able to solve for what the hydroxide will need to be for the precipitate to begin to form. So if I divide 2 times 10 million of fourth into the KSP value, I get 25. And if I take the square root of that 25, I get that I would need 5 molar of hydroxide ions, which is a fairly large amount of hydroxide in order for this precipitate to form. For calcium hydroxide, the equation is going to look very similar because barium and calcium are in the same group, so they form the same type of precipitate. The KSP expression is going to look um, just about the same other than CA instead of BA. Our KSP value is slightly different, 5.5 times 10 to the negative fifth, and our concentration of calcium was a little bit larger, 4 times 10 to the negative fourth. I would solve for x squared the same way I did before, but I see this time because 4 times 10 to the negative fourth was larger than 5.5 times 10 to the negative fifth, that x squared is a lot smaller, and then the concentration of hydroxide in that mixture is even less, 0.37 molar. Um, so I would need much less of the hydroxide ion for precipitation to occur with calcium hydroxide than I would have with barium hydroxide. So my hypothesis was supported because the KSP value was a little bit smaller for calcium hydroxide. It was able to precipitate um, with a smaller amount of hydroxide than was the BaOH2. All right, so this is going to be our last example. I will um, caution you now I have two students plus Ms. Henshaw in here, so if you hear random stuff, I apologize now. Um, this time we're taking um, 50 mils of 0.1 molar lead to nitrate, and we're mixing it with 50 mils of 0.1 molar potassium chloride. And we want to know if a precipitate forms. And we're given what the KSP is of lead to chloride. Um, I don't give you a KSP for potassium nitrate because all alkali metals are soluble and all nitrates are soluble, so that one is going to always dissociate. The um, KSP value is going to be greater than one like a strong acid um, or a strong base. Um, so we're only going to focus on whether lead and chlorine combine together to make a precipitate. So again, write my equation, write my KSP expression. Um, but before I can determine if a precipitate forms, just like we've had to do in lab, the lead ion and the chloride ion do not stay at 0.1 molar because they were diluted. We took 50 mils of the 0.1 molar lead to nitrate and added it to 50 mils of the 0.1 molar potassium chloride. So we need to figure out what their new concentrations are going to be. Um, so that's going to be using M1V1 equals M2V2. So if we take a look at lead, we had 1 PB in PBNO32, so the initial concentration is still going to be 0.1, and we have 50 mils of it. But when we add the 250 mils together, the new solution volume will be 100 mils. And so solving for M2, we would get that the concentration is reduced to half of the original amount, 0.05 molar. Chlorine, there's one chlorine in KCl, so there's still going to be 0.1 molar, um, and we have 50 mils of it. The new volume again is 100, so it's going to be just like it was for lead. Its concentration will also be 0.05 molar. I now know what the concentrations are of the lead and chlorine ions, and so I can substitute them into my K expression and solve for Q. I need to square the 0.05 for chlorine, and when I square it and multiply it by 0.05, or basically take 0.05 to the third, I get that the Q is 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth. That Q is much bigger than your K value by a factor of 10, so a precipitate does indeed form. And this should be able to get you through the last worksheet in part 2 of Unit 6.